Are you sure? Oh. oh. And the one on blackboard is the same. Oh. So just put that in. Oh. And the one on blackboard is. All right. How much time we got? So we still got uh, about forty-five minutes. Plenty of time. Okay. Okay. Cool. We're in business. All right. So today we're going to continue for one hundred and seventy. You guys on this side um, and AAE, AGNR one hundred and seventy environmental science. We're going to continue with the focusing in on the sustainable agriculture part. Yesterday we introduced you to the global agriculture and how food's produced in general and the conventional system, the industrialized system, right? Now we're going to start focusing in on the sustainable agriculture part. How do we do things differently? So some of this for this class and, and here, or the hybrid class sitting here, it's going to be a bit of a repetition, but yesterday we went over it very fast, but we're going to really focus in. For Granite Hills and the sustainable ag class, this is just kind of our introduction to where we're going next. We're going to delve into each one of these. Let's say, for example, soil degradation and how do we maintain good soils. We're going to spend a couple of weeks on that. How do we do better water conservation? We're going to spend a couple of weeks on that. Okay, so I'll come over tomorrow and we're going to really lay that out as to how the second eight weeks is going to go. And it's going to be quite different, really, from the first, first eight weeks, which, which I'm excited about. All right, so what, are the enviro what environmental problems arise from food production? Well, as you guys learned yesterday and Granite Hills learned quite a while ago, the biggest issues are by, in the areas of biodiversity. So with this new production, there's various ways that we're reducing biodiversity. And we all remember that biodiversity is a key principle of sustainability, right? We've all realized that all these little, in South Africa, we call them hohos, little bugs. All these little bugs and hohos are really important. If we pull too many pieces out of this ecosystem, we lose the integrity of the whole ecosystem. And we're going to have really big problems, okay? So that's biodiversity problem. We also have soil issues. And we're going to look at what those really are and how we can start mitigating those, fixing those. Water, we're overusing and, and wasting our water and our water supplies are dwindling all over the world. Uh, air, there's, there's definitely some air issues. They're not probably necessarily as big as those other ones, the first three, but they're really important. We're causing air pollution. For example, we talked about yesterday was all the big technology. Right, big tractors, big machinery that's needed for industrial agriculture is simply creating more of the global warming, fossil fuel use, right? Uh, so that's air. Human health, this is the one that I think surprises everyone because the issues with how we do food production, just as how we live in general, are unsustainable and they're starting to cause serious concerns about human health. Um, we're going to delve a little, just as a quick little example, into GMOs, genetically modified organisms. How much of a difference and problem is that to human health? So these are the kinds of issues we're going to talk about uh, in much more depth. Okay, so all comes back to this concept that we talked about up front is this whole focus that we have in sustainability, all of a sudden, we look in three perspectives, right, for three spheres. Remember the social sphere, the environmental sphere, and the economic sphere. And when we do that, we have to realize to do that, we need to look at different kinds of capital. Not just money and people and buildings and vehicles, but we have to look at natural capital, right? The things that go behind the scenes, and we've got not used to really paying attention to the things behind the scenes that make everything go. So if we're going to make a business out of doing better in the world, we need to look at biodiversity loss and making sure we maintain our biodiversity. Okay? And how is some of the ways that just food production is affecting that? Well, it's caused because we've converted large areas of grasslands, forests, and wetlands to crops or to rangeland. 
Well, what does that do? When you convert, what are we converting to? Just think about what we talked about yesterday, industrial agriculture. What is it? A monoculture. So you take the prairies, for example, of the United States, which of, there's a minuscule little bit of prairies left across the whole United States. We've converted into one species, which is corn or, or, or soybeans, whereas it was this beautiful, diverse ecosystem that helped, for example, maintain the soil and maintain habitat for, for uh, animals like, for example, a big issue there for them in, in that area is the sage grouse. It's an endangered bird, species of bird. And because we've converted this to cropland, we've lost that biodiversity. Now the trick is, through ecological restoration, which we will talk about in both classes a little bit later, how do we restore those ecology? How do we restore those habitats for those species? Fish kills from pesticide runoff. So literally, we're actually killing in certain situations, actually killing biodiversity. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. Killing wild predators to protect livestock. Okay, so one of the big stories that we talk about in the environmental science class especially is the uh, gray wolf. How did that get killed off originally? How did we do this incredible job of somehow wiping out this very secretive, very hard to hunt animal actually, we wiped it off the face of the United States? Well, that was mostly to protect animals and our livestock, right? And now we've, we've flipped that coin and we said, okay, let's reintroduce that gray wolf into Yellowstone and let's see if we can restore that ecosystem with this, you guys have just learned that top predator, the environmental science people, we, that important top predator, they're also a keystone species because of that. How do we restore it? Now we've got the opposite problem going. How do the farmers now get compensated because they have their animals, their livestock, their sheep, their cattle, the calves, right outside of Yellowstone. How do we balance that? Because the, cause the, the gray wolf, that's become actually done very, very well in, in, in Yellowstone, some people would say too well, is now obviously going outside and, and munching on some good little Angus calves or whatever, whatever happens to be the diet for the day, right? So... Um, so the last one here and this slide on the left-hand side there, um, it, you guys will obviously, we'll have this online and this, this video will be recorded, you guys, is loss of genetic uh, agrobiodiversity. So that's where we're looking at um, the actual loss of seed genetics. So we're, now we're looking just at the actual plants we're growing. So now instead of, we mentioned this, instead of having... 50 tomato plants with various attributes and resistance to <coughs> disease, we now have three that are grown commercially um, across the world. That's really putting all our eggs in one basket and not very smart. So that's where we start looking at a sustainable practice then is how do we develop what are called heirloom seeds? How do we grow and bring back those those the seeds and the plants from those older species, those genetically diverse species, okay? All right, so then the next little column on here that you guys can't see over there um, is actually soil, uh, soil erosion, uh, soil degradation, natural capital deg degradation. We all know soil is the key. Yesterday um, in the environmental science class, we talked about, and we'll talk later in 175, soil is a living ecosystem. It's got hundreds and thousands of little, little bacteria and microbes and earthworms that are making that work, recycling all those nutrients, right? Um, and erosion, simply getting washed away or locally getting blown away. So locally, you guys, on a bad windy day, it's like, oh, shit, that's <laughs> terrible. I'm getting dust in my house. I'm getting dust in my eyes. Farmers are looking at, hey, this is way worse than terrible. That's our livelihood getting literally blown away. Okay, so how do we do that? And we're going to start learning, especially in 175, how we, instead of over here, out here in Jess Ranch area and out where Lowe's is, where alfalfa used to grow, instead of leaving that land barren, instead of leaving this land barren across from the college where crops 
well, across that way from the college where crops used to grow, we should plant a cover crop. We should put something back there to hold that soil. Okay? Uh, loss of fertility. So industrial uh, agriculture uses the nutrients. The same plants are planted. Remember, one of the, the, one of the practices of industrial agriculture is what? Monoculture, right? Growing one plant, one species, one crop over and over again. That depletes the fertility because that plant only uses certain kinds of fertility. We're also not fertilizing very well. We're using just, uh, we talk about those being crops on steroids because they only get those three kinds of synthetic fertilizer nutrients, right? N nitrogen, potassium, and uh, phosphate. So that's soil fertility. Salinization, talk about that a lot more when we get to water. If we, if we water or irrigate in the wrong way and it evaporates too much, we lose too much evaporation, the side effect of that is also leaves behind all those salts that were in the water. Think of your swamp cooler, if you have a swamp cooler in certain areas here, gets all that caked white stuff on that, same thing. As it evaporates, it leaves behind the salts. Okay? Waterlogging. If we irrigate in the wrong way, we can actually waterlog the plants. We can actually overwater them. And then desertification. Both classes are going to look at this in more detail, how certain practices like overgrazing in dry areas will kill the grasses and it will move towards the desert. Okay, water, we're going to go through this one kind of quickly because we both will go back to water issues, water degradation, natural capital being water. We all know how important that is, or water, the way you guys say it, right? Um, and that's aquifer depletion, and we started talking about that yesterday. We all have a real case study of that locally because we only depend on aquifer water, a ground, what's also called groundwater. Other parts have surface water that they can get. They can pull directly from the Colorado River, for example. We don't get the luxury of that. Okay, pollution from pesticides and fertilizers. Talked a little bit about that. The one we didn't talk about a lot yesterday would be an algal bloom, a bloom of algae. So a couple of years ago, um, it was a really interesting situation because the wind was blowing up the hill and they had a huge algal bloom in the Salton Sea down beyond Palm Springs, right? And I read in the newspaper that there was a strange smell from this thing. And I was like, you're kidding me. That's like 100 miles away, at least 100 miles away. And sure enough, you could smell. And what you could smell is what happens is that algal bloom, when too much nutrients, extra nutrients from agriculture, the fertilizers mostly, go into the Salton Sea, the algae overproduces and it blooms and it, the whole place goes green. But what that does is call, cause an oxygen deficit for everything else. So now all of a sudden, all the oxygen is going to the algae and not to the fish and the fish actually die. And they died in the hundreds of thousands as they've done before. And they were all along the banks of the Salton Sea and we could actually smell it. I might have been, I might have been bluffing myself but I read it in the paper and I walked outside and I smelt a strange smell. I mean, might have been my dog doing bad things. I don't know. This was a couple years ago. So algal blooms even happen and we know of this around here. Okay, the next column is air degradation. And that's emission of greenhouse gases. We've talked about that. Um, other air pollutants from fossil fuel use and then also pesticides. That, those pesticides don't just go on the crops, they obviously are spray, sprayed and get airborne, okay? The last one, what is that noise? Sounds like a cricket. Oh, way outside, okay. Okay, I just wanna make sure I wasn't gonna blow up or something. Nitrates, okay, human health. Many, many issues, right? We talked about nitrates. We're gonna, we're gonna on our field trip, we're actually gonna really see this issue. Nitrates are a, a, a form of nitrogen, and they can, be, they can get in the water. Pesticides can cause all kinds of problems. Livestock waste in drinking water. Bacterial contamination of meat, right? So we've seen quite a bit of this, whether it's jack-in-the-box, whether it's chipotle. These, if you don't handle the meat properly, you're going to get contamination. Things like salmonella that are very, very dangerous bacteria that can get in. 
And what hap why is that often caused? It's caused by us being in a big hurry and doing industrialized agriculture. All right. All right. So moving on. Soil degradation. We're going to look at this one a little bit closer. What is soil erosion? Anybody here still fuzzy about what soil erosion is? All we need to know really is it's got natural causes. It happens normally. That's how we actually build soils in the, in the first place, right? As we talked about yesterday, really quickly, soil is just a bunch of little, little rocks, little pieces of rock, right? The sand is the bigger ones, silt is the slightly smaller, and then clay is mostly microscopic. When we mix those all together, that's kind of like the substrate for the soil. Then what, to make a living, working soil that can cycle nutrients and grow plants, we have to add all the living matter. That's the ecosystem part, right? And so we can have natural causes. That's just a, a river flowing down. It could be natural rain. It's going to wash and erode things. Wind, natural. But then when we bring humans in, we tend to make that worse, right? We, for example, what's just happened in Houston, we dam up areas. We don't allow the river to go where it has to go. So then it dams up, we put berms along the sides of the river, and a big rain comes like that, and it overflows into agriculture. But as we all heard, mostly, most of the damage that was publicized was to, to the city and the people itself, right? So there's human causes. Two major harmful effects of soil erosion is loss of soil fertility. What's eroding away but that A horizon, the one at the very top, that's got all the, well, let me think, is that actually A or C? Which one horizon is at the top, A or C? A. A horizon's got all the living stuff in it, and that's where the, all the nutrients are, so loss of fer fertility, and then water pollution. So you're like, what kind of water pollution comes from soil erosion? Well, the actual sediment pollutes the water. Right, and doesn't really hurt us that much. But for example, uh, a uh, coral reef can literally get smothered by the water pollute by the the silt that's in uh, eroded uh, water eroded water. Okay, the next one, soil degradation. We'll come back to this. Is desertification. You all will see that in your notes. Something for you to do at home is to watch the TED Talk by Alan Savory. He's a Af South African, Kenyan guy that's that done a lot of work in this area. But he talks about desertification from human agriculture. Okay, um, Problems associated with excessive irrigation. We're going to go into this in detail. Water soil salinization and water logging again. Uh, Next kind of degradation, just digging a little bit deeper, we already talked about biodiversity degradation. So we've talked about all three of those, the loss of, of the genetic, genetic uh, biodiversity in the actual seeds, the agrodiversity they call that, conversion of grasslands and forests, and then GMOs, advantages and disadvantages. Okay. Um, and in 175, each one of those, especially the GMO, Thing, we're going to delve a lot deeper. Okay, so here's a really quick little little uh, diagram. It's a, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, of genetically modified crops and organisms. And on the left, we have the advantages. There's a picture of some folks that can't see this. Picture of some okay. tomatoes and some corn in there, um, and Projected advantages of a GMO, it may need less fertilizer and it may lead pest, less pesticides and water, right? Talked about those GMOs as just one example, that new strain, genetically modified corn that can handle very drought, dry conditions, which is considered by a lot of people to be a major sustainable advantage in, in places that are are turning to desert that have major desertification issues. Um, it can, they can be resistant to certain insects. That's why we do it. Um, they can grow faster. One of the things they do, what reasons they do it, they grow faster, produce more, and they can tolerate higher levels of herbicide. We talked about the Roundup Ready 
Roundup Ready. Roundup is the major herbicide used in agriculture all over the world, produced by the company Monsanto. And one of the GMOs is Roundup Ready. We talked about how you can, you can come along, you plant your, your crop, and of course your corn and your weeds come up. You spray with uh, Roundup Ready, uh, sp spray with Roundup, and it'll kill all the, all the weeds but leave your corn. And that actually prevents, it does have a side advantage of preventing you from using a lot of other kinds of herbicides as well. So there are some advantages. Um, the disadvantages are very well publicized and very real, I think, most of them. I think there's still a level of paranoia about it, but that's just my p personal opinion. Um, there's genetic issues. Will these GMOs crossbreed with the natural regular corn, okay? And therefore, basically, you get transmission of these when you don't really want it. Um, that's one issue. The other biggest one is health issues. What does it do to the people, animals that eat the corn produced GMO by GMO varieties? And we talked about, I think in corn it's over 80%. Does anybody know exactly? It's over 80% of our corn in the United States is GMO. Okay. And so again, we're kind of, we've got that. What do we do now? Do we, do we just stop eating all corn? It, whatever we do has to be kind of a graded, well thought out response. Okay, another one of industrial agriculture has to do with biodiversity loss and just focusing on certain species would be animal feedlots. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of those? So those, these are called confined feeding operations or CAFOs. And we put all the animals in one place in corrals, whether they're or, or cages, whether they're chickens, pigs, dairy cattle. We're going to visit a feedlot, confined feeding uh, dairy. So you'll get to see what this really looks like um, and what, what's really going on. Um, why do we do that? Increase meat production, increase dairy production, higher profits. Less land use. Definitely we're going to use less land when we do that. Reduced overgrazing. These are some really cool things. Reduced soil erosion. Protection of biodiversity. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to think through how they get that one, but we'll kind of roll over that for a moment. But the disadvantages are large inputs of grain, fish meal, and often people are saying, well, you... Doing it this way without letting the cattle go out and eat things that humans... The big question here is, are ca... let's pick on cattle. Can cattle that have a rumen that can digest things that we can't digest, should we just let them go out and eat the grass and eat the bushes and eat the range? And yes, we should. Or if we bring them into a confined feeding operation, now we start feeding them really food that could be fed to humans, right? It's very high quality, very nutritious food, and that is a big issue. That when the price of corn skyrocketed a few years ago, there were people in Mexico actually protesting and saying, hey, what's going on here? Why can't, can't we afford to buy our, our uh, staple uh, grain, which is corn? Okay? Greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, uh, methane, huge... Uh, push back against these feedlots because of concentrating them, we've got more of them, we have methane production, that's what the gas coming out of the back of them and us is, a lot of it is methane. And methane is a very, very serious greenhouse gas. It's a lot worse than carbon dioxide itself. Um, use of antibiotics, if they're used to increase uh, the rate of gain, um, growth hormones, all of these tend to be used more, not exclusively, but more in these confined feeding operations than they're used in the more natural situations. Okay? You will find out that at this particular dairy in California, they do none of those because they can't. They can't afford to have their milk contaminated because the dairy will send back all their milk if they find any antibiotics in it. So some of this stuff is, is a little bit more 
publicized because we pick on the really bad situations. And, and a lot of it isn't even really a problem. But again, remember, I have a bias. I'm a farmer. So I'm going to stand up for farmers when it's appropriate. Okay, biodiversity and deg degradation. What's the sustainable practice when we come to pesticides, right? Obviously, the pesticide doesn't just kill the pest we're trying to kill, but it kills a whole bunch of other things. Integrated pest management, which we will discuss um, more, is we actually will encourage other what we call beneficial insects to be there. So, for example, wasps. Wasps are a predator, and they will eat the bad insects, the, the little grub or whatever it is that's eating your corn, a wasp will, will, will pre predate on that. So in, in integrated pest management, we actually, for example, one of the things we do and one of our students has done a lot of work on is we will grow what they call natural native hedgerows around fields where the native uh, beneficial insects can actually survive. And so then they help manage the pest, the bad insect, that whatever it is in, on the crop, okay? Disadvantages. Um, well, what is integrated pest management? It coordinates cultivation. So one way we get rid of pests or weeds is we cultivate it. So old school, you, that's why you see corn grown. If you're not agricultural, you, corn's grown in rows. We don't just scatter the seed. And old way, and good way to do that is we have a thing called a, a harrow and we go go down it has blades spread apart like this and the corn's in the middle and a few rows of it and it goes down and it cultivates it actually tills it disturbs it digs up the weeds so that is cultivation to remove some of these these uh, pests or, or weeds biological controls the ones we're talking about to the extent that we actually introduce things that will uh, take care of the problem. Locally, we have a great example of that, not for crops, but for a bad invasive weed we have here, right here in the Mojave River, called the tamarisk or salt cedar. We've actually introduced a, a, a beetle from Asia that will only eat that particular kind of tree. You have to be very careful with those because they can also get out of control, and there have been lots of problems with that kind of biocontrol, but it's become very sophisticated. Sophisticated. We have a whole government department called APHIS that deals with that. They, they test and evaluate and decide how they're going to release these biological controls. And then there's also chemical tools. For example, uh, there's things like vinegar, very concentrated vinegar that can be put on. There's soap for certain kinds of things like whitefly, you can actually spray the plant with soap and it will actually control that pest, okay? And it's a balance, it's a mixture of all those things, okay? Disadvantages, it's very uh, technical. We have a class in our department going on right now called Integrated Pest Management, so you can learn about it as well. It's a lot of jobs in this area actually, relatively. Uh, more time required than using pesticides, much easier just to rent a rig or fly a plane and just spray the whole thing, takes less time. High initial costs to get this going. And there's not really as much government support for this as you would imagine. They need to subsidize and help with this as much as they could. Uh, okay? Um, so 7.5, right in the middle of this chapter again toward the end. How do we now, through our policies, more of the social side of of sustainability, how do we now help push towards sustainability, okay? So one of the ways we do that is we control prices to make food more affordable, okay? If we could control prices and farmers could know that they're going to get um, a decent price for, for their crop or for, a really good example is dairy. We could know, if a dairy farmer could know that they'd get this price, a good price, a fair price, and it would just stay stable. But it doesn't. Because of the stock market and the commodities market, it's all over the board, up and down and around and about. 
these kinds of sustainable practices require money, they require time, they require this investment in knowledge and, and money, and that would help tremendously if we could stabilize prices across the agricultural industry, okay? Um, if we provided subsidies to farmers, okay? And so um, your guest lecture this week that you're not going to get um, in person in environmental science class is Tony Walters. He's an ex-student of ours. Go on, online. The video is up there. Go check out the video. He works for a group that I also volunteer with called the Resource Conservation District. And we are the arm of the system that offers subsidies and grants from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So, for example, and he talks about it in the video, of the different things they do to help support sustainability in agriculture. For example, we, we will help a farmer pay about 75% of one of those new boom systems you saw in the car, in the, the, those, those center pivot systems where the irrigation goes around in a big circle, it's super efficient, and like I said yesterday in this class, it's 80% efficient, the, the simplest uh, ones that you can get, um, as against flood irrigation, which is only 50% efficient. And that efficiency is simply how much water is getting to that plant. Flood irrigated, flooded, only 50% average is getting to the roots of the plant and causing growth. That's what you're trying to do, right? With this, 80% is. And that's huge savings and, and tremendous advantage. But it takes some subsidies. Farmers can't afford to do that all on their own. Okay, and that encourages you know, them to do the right thing. Um, soil conservation methods, and we started getting into this yesterday. How do we do soil conservation? How do we, we prevent it from blowing away in erosion or washing away or from fertility? Well, we can do terracing, right? If, you've, if you're planting on a hill and there are no terraces to hold the water and hold the soil, then it's all just going to wash down the hill. And, you know, this is no surprise. Like a lot of this stuff, we didn't think of this recently this has been around forever in places like china you see those those terraces those rings going with the contour up so these little level patches that go all the way around the hill or across the slope holding those resources especially the water in place so plants grow better because they have much more water and you don't use the soil contour farming terracing same thing strip cropping keeping uh not using as much tillage as much plowing as we talked about yesterday which tears up the soil, allows it to erode, destroys the fertility. Alley cropping, agroforestry, we saw a picture of that yesterday. Trees in a row that kind of stabilize the soil, their roots stabilize the soil, and then you plant between them, whichever crop. Windbreaks. We used to do a lot of that in our department. We ran a service to sell windbreak trees so that if you're really going to manage for that, all across here you would see strips of trees slowing down the wind so that it wouldn't be able to erode as much. Conservation tillage farming, which again is a little bit of what we already talked about, but that's no till or minimum till, right? We actually literally inject the seeds into the soil instead of plowing and disturbing that soil. All right, there we go, some pictures. So, top there, you've got some terraces, more terraces on the right. You've got some agroforestry, strip planting. And then over here, another one they didn't really talk about that really helps is, is multi-cropping. Having a lot of crops growing at the same time. Okay? That really helps with soil, soil uh, stability. Okay? How can we restore soil fertility now? Not talking about it washing, blowing away, but the fertility itself. Really use our animal manures uh, and our green manure. Green manure is when we take uh, organic matter, tree clippings, grass clippings, food waste, and we compost it. We allow bacteria. What you, all you're doing in composting is you're setting up a system where bacteria can actually start digesting that stuff. Start those cycles going so the carbon and the nitrogen and the sulfur and all of that can be recycled 
to where the plant roots can take them up and use them again. And then that plant dies and it becomes green waste to go back into the soil. But we have to artificially do that in our system because we don't allow time for it just to lie on top of the soil and compost on its own, all right? When you do your lawn clippings, for example, what are, the, what are the people doing? They're picking them up and throwing them in the garbage. Well, most of the time, that's all going to waste right now, in, especially in the urban environment, okay? We can use synthetic inorganic uh, fertilizers. We can still use organic, inorganic fertilizers. Those are the ones that are mined. Those are the synthetic ones. We just use them appropriately and wisely, okay? And then we can use crop rotation. Grow lots of different crops. Different crops use different minerals. Different crops, like we learned yesterday, actually put certain minerals, like nitrogen, right back in the soil. So legumes, beans, clovers, they all put nitrogen back in the soil, which is a tremendous benefit. And then prevent soil salinization. If we irrigate properly, we don't have to have soil salinization. Okay, um, so another issue that we have we talked about yesterday sustainability of our food supply is what's going on with our meat and our protein. And we can do, um, we can grow that more sustainably. We talked about the demand for meat and fish is growing because as societies become more affluent in places like China and India, the first thing they want to do is eat better and eat those kinds of things like, like meat. They, they, that's something they strive for, okay? So we can produce the beef more out on the rangeland. So locally we have a lot of rangeland that we, I was just riding my mountain bike on it last night, and it's kind of going to waste right now because there's a lot of grass, a lot of food out there, and for various reasons we're not grazing that as much as we used to. That's food that we can't as people digest. That's just fiber to us. A cow that... Cow, Animals that have a rumen have a big digestion vat in their stomach where those same microbes digest the stuff for them, okay? And they can do that. Select more efficient livestock. We continue to do this. You're going to see a slide in a moment about what kind of livestock makes a difference, whether it's beef or whether chicken. Chickens are much more efficient in, in converting those nutrients into food for us than beef is, for example. Shift to more grain efficient uh, protein forms. So we as, as people need to start, remember talked to yesterday about, we call it eating down the food chain. Instead of taking the food and giving it to an animal and then eating the animal, we eat that food. And that's about 90% more efficient when we do that. So we can do that and we can look for proteins. You know, you have to eat things like, like proteins from beans and and soybeans and things like that. Practice more sustainable aquaculture. Probably a new word for some of you, but aquaculture is doing agriculture, growing fish and shellfish in, in an agricultural kind of setting where we, we're putting specific inputs in and trying to produce those fish without them being completely in their natural habitat. Okay. Aquaculture, some of the advantages and disadvantages, high efficiency, high yield, reduce over-harvesting of fisheries. Big sustainable issue for the world is we have decimated certain kinds of fisheries, certain populations. Bluefin tuna is an example. You know, they're literally hunting those things from a helicopter and airplanes that spot the pods and then they send in these high-powered speedboats to, to corral these things, okay? Jobs and profits, disadvantage, large inputs of land, feed, and water, pollution, loss of mangroves. Mangroves are a very specific plant that grows right at the edge, the interface between the ocean and the water that are very important nurseries for lots of different kinds of fish. And... These den po dense populations, when we put them in those, if you can see, this one has those. You can see these in Baja, Mexico. These have those, those basically netting rings and the fish. But when they're all concentrated, they're much more vulnerable to disease. You can see those on the road down to Ensenada if you look for them, for example. There is this conversion of what we choose. Beef cattle are the top, a factor of seven. 
if we eat fish or chicken, it's about two. So they're eating chicken is about three times more efficient to eat chicken. Just in the, in the way they convert, how efficiently they convert all the food and nutrition into food for us. Okay? Um, more sustainable agriculture. So what, this is a really key slide of the uh, more and less disadvantages and advantages. What do we need to do in sustainable agriculture? We need to have more high yield polyculture, growing multiple crops together. We need to use organic fertilizers, biological pest control, integrated pest management, efficient irrigation, perennial crops. If we can get our food from a crop that grows for multiple years, um, is much better than each year having to replant the, the crop. Uh, crop rotation, using soil and the land for different things at different times, builds up the soil for one thing. Water efficient crops, we can find crops that grow more. We, across the world, we generally see a water fish. One thing I want to bring up to you guys is that we don't really understand being in this country is most of the world's food is grown in what's called dry land agriculture, right? They depend on the rains. So growing up in South Africa, even though we were fairly, guess, not subsistence farmers, but more sophisticated farmers, we, right, we'll see you guys, Granite Hills. I'll be over there tomorrow so we can, we can get things sorted out. Sorry about the lack of the PowerPoint this morning, but hopefully we can get this sorted out. But anyway, they depend on the rain. So if climate change happens, as we're starting to see, definitely I think some evidence that climate is changing. Well, that means you can't predict that I'm going to plant my corn in August. It's going to sit in the soil for a couple of weeks, and then I'm going to get, um, you know, rains. If those rains don't come, then everything dies. Or you get a little bit of rain, and the crop comes up, and, the, and all those little plants die. So that's a huge issue. Again, Houston with these big, uh, Houston, Texas, the untold story is all the crops that got wiped out across across uh, Florida and Texas, okay? Soil conservation, subsidies, we've talked about that. Less of soil erosion. But actually, all we've talked about all of those things, of the advantages, the solutions from different kinds of sustainable agriculture, okay? Um, how can we, as the people, remember the big thing about all of this as an environmental science person who's interested in sustainability or a responsible citizen, is what is our part? What can we do as people? Okay. We can increase sustainable agricultural research. We can establish education and training programs. Well, you guys are part of one of those, so that's pretty cool. Provide international aid to farmers in poor countries. Not just give them money, but actually give them money towards sustainable practices and harmful subsidies. So let's not subsidize corn production in Kansas so that they can grow eth they can use it for ethanol, which is not sustainable and doesn't even make enough energy to balance up what you use. It's negative. Um, we can in initiate helpful subsidies. We can educate consumers about the true cost of the food they buy. So there's the big one, right? We can buy differently. If you don't like the way a certain product's being produced or you don't think it's sustainable, then you choose not to buy it. So the ultimate thing with GMOs is if, if that's an issue that you th you're serious about, then you've got then you can go and buy non-GMO foods. And that market is gonna, gonna build and the, the law of supply and demand, that's gonna promote the non-GMO focus, right? Um, okay, this is kind of last slide, I think. Um, what can we do? Continue, eat less meat, kind of talked about that. I hope you guys understand how to eat down the food chain. Each time we convert from one, what they call trophic level to the next, we lose about 90% of the energy, nutrition, all of it, okay? Choose sustainably produced herbivorous fish. So make sure that when you do buy salmon or whatever it is, 
that they produce sustainably. They do have a sustainable fisheries council. So you can actually look for a stamp on tuna or on, 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 uh, on salmon, for example. They'll tell you that it's sustainably produced. And they, those companies have to go through certain sustainable practices. Okay? Buy certified organic food. I won't get into this a little bit, but this is a mixed bag because people say it's organic, but how do you know that it's organic? And what does organic even mean? That's a whole conversation that the 175 class will be dealing with. Eat locally grown food. We do have some locally grown food. You can get it at the farmer's market. I personally think that it should be cheaper than it is because they don't have to transport it. They don't have to have all the middlemen people resell it. Compost food waste, super easy to do. I don't know why I like it in Australia. Many households have a little worm bin out the far side the back door. They put all their waste in there and they let the, the little California red worms or some kind of worm do the composting for them. Um, and cut food waste, right? We're just, just think about your last three meals and how much stuff just got left on that plate and why. And why was that necessary? We've almost become a habit. We, I think we almost feel better if there's something left on the plate. You guys are lucky you didn't grow up with my mom because you should cut your head off. That. So, but we just, we, it's just norm. It's no, it's no big deal. You know, you buy three hamburgers and you eat two of them and just throw the other way. It's, 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 it's too easy. Okay. So thank you very much. And thank you, AAE. We will, we will, I'm planning, Mr. Mr. Huffman, I'm planning to come over there on Thursday. Is that okay? Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Good. Awesome. Thank you.